Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am Donna Larkin Moore, one of your worship associates. I am joined today by another worship associate and leader of our service, Brianna Zamborski, along with pianist Forrest Howell, Cantor Kay Rittinger, and with technical support from Zoom host Drika DeGraff and Zoom greeter Jane O'Neill. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at half past 10 and then later posted on Facebook. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. The lay leaders of this congregation have worked diligently over many years to earn special designations from the Unitarian Universalist Association. In 1994, we became a welcoming congregation, a term that means we are committed to being intentionally inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and families. We are also a green sanctuary congregation, which is a similar program for environmental justice work in our congregation. Although there is no such designation for racial justice, we are deeply committed to that work as well. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups, and we hope that you will participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope you will stay after the service and get to know us. And now, four announcements to share. Our annual poinsettia sale is now open. This year's sale benefits the entire religious education program, and we are taking orders online. We have large red plants for $25 and small red plants for $10. You can also order gift poinsettias for other BUCers. The order form now gives you the options to order plants that you will pick up and order plants that we will deliver as gifts. You can do both or either and staff will choose the gift recipients. You can submit your payment online by Venmo or by check. Simply place your order by clicking the red order poinsettias button on our website. All orders are due by the 6th of December. The BUC Adopt a Family program is a testament to the great generosity of our members and friends. You have already adopted most of our families or donated money toward the program and your love and caring for your fellow humans is deeply appreciated. We do have a few more families who need our help. To sign up, you can go to the BUC website and click on the orange Adopt a Family button or contact Jane O'Neill for more information. The deadline to sign up is December 6th. That's just one week from today. So please don't delay brightening the holidays for these families. This coming Tuesday, December 1st, is our monthly Vesper service at 7 p.m. The service will take place on Facebook Live. This is a joyful yet introspective evening service that centers gratitude for the day that has passed and welcomes the night that is beginning. The service will include candle lighting in remembrance of your beloved dead and any concerns in your heart. Names and information for candle lighting can be submitted via this link on our website under worship links or shared during the service on Facebook Live. To view the service live, visit the Birmingham Unitarian Church Facebook page at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. The video will also remain on our Facebook page for later viewing. And last, this Friday, December 4, at 7 p.m., the Pastoral Care Associates present 
Managing Your Mental Health During the Pandemic with Dr. Mel Chudnoff. In this interactive Zoom lecture, Dr. Chudnoff will discuss strategies and precautions we can take to protect our mental health and deal with the feelings of anxiety, irritability, excitability, and worry that are natural during these difficult times. Zoom information is on the meeting calendar and will be shared in the weekly update email. And now our service will begin. <laughs> Good morning. Little flame. Light the tender kindling of our souls and make a roaring blaze of warmth and love and community. From this spark may a fire of compassion spread from heart to heart and light our way, sweet spirit, light our way. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will, it will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get Thank you. Today, we will focus on self-compassion. So for opening words, I selected to worship from our hymnal. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars, before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To worship is to be silent, receptive, before a tree astir with the wind or the passing shadow of a cloud. 
to worship is to work with dedication and with skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. To worship is to sing with the singing beauty of the earth. It is to listen through a storm to the still, small voice within. Worship is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is a kindred fire within our hearts. It moves through deeds of kindness and through acts of love. Worship is the mystery within us, reaching out to the mystery beyond. It is an inarticulate silence yearning to speak. It is the window of the moment open to the sky of the eternal. And now we will have an offering. Your gifts for this morning's offering may come in the form of a check or by going to our website using Venmo. Why do we give? We give because it makes us feel good. We give because we are able to. We give because it is the traditional thing to do. We give because we learned to do so as children. We give because our beloved community means so much to us individually and collectively. We give. Thank you for your gifts. And now we move further into the spirit of reflection, the spiritual practices that center our worship together. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows. Just a reminder that we pause the recording of our service here and we'll resume the recording after we're done sharing. I invite you now to move deeper with me into a moment of prayer and reflection. Spirit of life, as we finish this special time of giving thanks, help us remember to be thankful for every part of ourselves, every emotion from joy to sorrow, every brain cell and every bone, everything that makes us human and here and alive to see this almost last day of another November and whatever it may bring.
Recently, I received an email with some good advice. I ignored the part where they were trying to sell me something. The email said, the world is not slowing down whether we like it or not. While that can be a bit perturbing, it's sometimes helpful to look back into our history at the major hurdles we've overcome as a people. Major world wars, economic depressions, plagues, and famines. We humans are tough, and this pandemic too shall pass. In the meantime, it's on each and every one of us to maintain our collective cool and nourish our minds and bodies with the love they need to thrive through these turbulent times. What does that look like? I'm talking meditation, moving your body daily, eating well, nurturing your closest relationships, and perhaps bringing even some ritual or some spiritual practice into your life. Today, we will focus on self-compassion. In Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication, he writes, it is our nature to enjoy giving and receiving compassionately. We have, however, learned many forms of life alienating communication that lead us to speak and behave in ways that injure others and ourselves. One form of life alienating communication is the use of moralistic judgments that imply wrongness or badness on the part of those who don't act in harmony with our values. Another is the use of comparisons, which can block compassion both for others and for ourselves. Life alienating communication also obscures our awareness that we are each responsible for our own thoughts, feelings, and actions. When we make mistakes, instead of getting caught up in the moralistic self-judgments, we can use the process of mourning and self-forgiveness to show us where we can grow by assessing our behaviors in terms of our own unmet needs, the impetus for change comes not out of shame, guilt, anger, or depression, but out of the genuine desire to contribute to our own and others' well-being. We also cultivate self-compassion by consciously choosing in daily life to act only in service to our own needs and values rather than out of duty for extrinsic rewards or to avoid guilt, shame, and punishment. If we review the joyless acts to which we currently subject ourselves and make the translation from have to to choose to, we will discover more play and integrity in our lives. We hope you come away from today's worship service with something that helps enable your own self-compassion. Somewhere. There is-
One day, several years ago in Detroit, a man walked by me and said, who's your tiger? What? Who, who's my tiger? What a weird question. Then he gestured to the old English D on my, on my hoodie sweatshirt in the corner. And I realized he was talking about the baseball team. I'd lived in Michigan my whole life though, and I'd never heard this question before. Then I was immediately concerned, was I supposed to answer this? I didn't even think I could name a single Tiger player, let alone have a favorite. So I just smiled, feeling slightly abashed. Maybe I needed to start watching more baseball. So now I ask you, this is why I share this anecdote. Who's your favorite principal? Yes, I'm asking, like my big city friend, which of the seven UU principles is your favorite? Mine is the first principle the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Usually when I think of this one, I imagine Oprah saying, you have worth and dignity and you have worth and dignity. Everybody has worth and dignity and welcoming people with open arms. But there's another way to look at it. And I would argue a way we need to look at it to move toward truly valuing others and truly benefiting from our interconnectedness. We need to turn the first principle around. How often do we hear inherent worth and dignity of every person and think of ourselves? Our focus as a social justice minded faith is usually on how others are treated, particularly the historically marginalized and oppressed, whose inherent worth and dignity has not been honored. But fortunately, many of us don't honor our own either. In the 80s and 90s, recognizing this problem, there was a huge self-esteem movement with self-help books and school programs, all aimed at making people feel better about themselves by increasing their self-esteem. Unfortunately, this didn't really work. Self-esteem, it turns out, isn't the answer. Self-compassion is. So here's a, a long excerpt from Kristen Neff herself, who is a leading author and researcher on this topic of self-compassion, explaining the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion. Although self-compassion may seem similar to self-esteem, they are different in many ways. Self-esteem is about judging ourselves positively. It refers to our perceived value and how much we like ourselves. In modern Western culture, self-esteem is often based on how much we are different from others, how much we stand out or are special. It is not okay to be average when self-esteem is valued. We have to feel above average to feel good. This means that attempts to raise our self-esteem may actually result in narcissistic self-absorbed behavior, or lead us to put others down in order to feel better about ourselves. We also tend to get angry and aggressive toward those who have said or done anything that makes us feel bad about ourselves. The need for high self-esteem may encourage us to ignore, distort, or hide personal shortcomings so that we can't see ourselves clearly or accurately anymore. Finally, our self-esteem is often contingent on our latest success, meaning that our self-esteem fluctuates depending on ever-changing circumstances. In contrast to self-esteem, self-compassion is not based on self-evaluations. People feel compassion for themselves because they are human beings and all human beings deserve compassion and understanding not because they possess some particular trait or set of traits, pretty smart, talented. This means that with self-compassion, you don't have to feel better than others to feel good about yourself. Self-compassion also allows for greater self-clarity because for personal failings can be acknowledged with kindness and do not need to be hidden. Moreover, self-compassion isn't dependent on external circumstances. It's always there, even and especially 
when you fall flat on your face. Self-compassion is associated with greater emotional resilience, more accurate self-concept, more caring relationship behavior, as well as less narcissism and reactive anger. So this isn't actually a lecture about self-esteem versus self-compassion, but I wanted to define those. And this analysis is very interesting considering our theme for the month of interconnectedness. Which avenue of finding worth helps connect people more? The one that's about competition and comparison and being better and special and different? Or the one that's about being human like every other human? All right, so how do you practice self-compassion? You might be wondering if you're convinced that this is the way to go. Having compassion for yourself isn't really any different than having compassion for someone else, which I think most people are pretty good at. There are three elements of self-compassion. The first one is self-kindness versus judgment. So when you feel compassion for someone else, you're attuned to their suffering. The word compassion actually means to suffer with. You are warm and caring, even if that person messed up. You offer them understanding and kindness, not criticism or judgment. So, can you do this for yourself? Can you put the self-flagellating torture device down and be nice? Here's a therapist trick. Get a photo of yourself as a child, a very cute one, and imagine talking to that little child the way that you talk to yourself in your head when you're not being compassionate. Ouch. Or imagine a best friend, if that works. You wouldn't say those cruel things to that beloved child or friend. So don't do it to yourself. The second element of self-compassion is common humanity versus isolation. This is the one that ties back best to the self-esteem uh, versus self-compassion. You are human. All the suffering you endure is part of being human and all humans endure suffering. Understanding this, instead of believing that you are alone and separate in your pain, will help you feel compassion for yourself and all other human beings. Life is hard. We're in this together. We're all connected in this way. The third element of self-compassion is mindfulness. As you use, many of us are very familiar with practices of meditation or yoga and how beneficial mindfulness is. To have self-compassion, we have to be able to recognize and sit with our feelings rather than suppress them. The whole concept of self-compassion, in fact, is very Buddhist. As one of our sources, we can turn to it for spiritual guidance. This is ancient wisdom, not a new idea. Okay, so there are lots and lots of meditations that you can do to cultivate self-compassion and loving kindness. Uh, I actually recommend Kristen Neff's um, website. She has written ones and um, audio guided ones, lots of them. This is a very short one though that I like because it's accessible anytime, anywhere. Um, and I'm going to share it with you now. It's called a self-compassion break. So you can do this when you are in the middle of um, an actual moment when you need it right now, we, or you can, to practice self-compassion, you can um, you know, bring up a moment. So think of a situation in your life that is difficult, that is causing you stress. Call the situation to mind. See if you can actually feel the stress and emotional discomfort in your body. Now say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. There are alternative phrases for each of these. You could also say, this hurts or simply, ouch. This is the mindfulness part, just recognizing the feeling. Then you say, 
suffering is a part of life or other people feel this way too or I am not alone. This is the common humanity part. Now you can put your hands over your heart or in another kind of loving touch that you need and say, may I be kind to myself. Or you can use another phrase here as well. May I give myself the compassion that I need. May I learn to accept myself as I am. May I forgive myself. You can also, in this moment, ask yourself, what do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? And create your own sort of mantra that you can tell yourself. So this is a very, the, the actual guided one is five minutes long, but this is a very fast thing that you can do. Sometimes being home with my daughter and trying to homeschool her and, you know, uh, every, every stress of this pandemic, I can do it in 30 seconds and, um, you know, kind of give myself whatever I need to, to get through the next moments. Um, so you really can do it uh, anywhere and very quickly. If you start working on self-compassion, not only are you going to start feeling more loving kindness toward yourself, it will spill out into the world. All my life, I've considered myself to be very non-judgmental and kind, but it wasn't until I realized that the way I talked to myself was incredibly judgmental and unkind that I saw that that actually spilled out into the world as well. Once you flip this, not only will you be filled with loving kindness, which is one of my favorite hymns and is actually based on um, a Buddhist prayer, I just found out, um, but you will start to fill the world with loving kindness as well. And if we did that, what a difference it could make. If we can look at our first principle and remember self-compassion, and treat ourselves as if we have worth and dignity. It follows that we will treat others that way. Self-compassion as part of a daily spiritual practice for self-care is important and will help you as an individual. But another message today is that fostering self-compassion can actually become a form of community care as well. So the goal is not just our own emotional health, but the emotional health of our society which we very much need. Famous Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us, there's no separation between self and other. Everything is interconnected. We may find it hard to see the inherent worth and dignity of ourselves or of some people right now in our divided world, but we are all connected, whether we like it or not, and maybe practicing on a personal level could lead to healing on a larger level and we could all live in a more compassionate world. When our heart is in a holy place, 
when our heart is in a holy place. We are blessed with love and amazing grace, when our heart is in a holy place. When we share the silence of sacred space, and the God of our hearts turns within, and we feel the power of each other's face, when our heart is in a holy place, then we rise again, a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place. We are blessed with love and amazing grace, when our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place. Fellow flawed humans, remember this week with whatever it brings that our hearts are always in a holy place for we are always connected. Know that deep down our hearts beat in one universal rhythm. May we each through self-compassion find the sacred space to hear it. <laughs>